Good morning. Uh, man, it's a little warm this morning. I know. I, I, I am a little afraid to take my jacket off, to be honest. I, I would I would afraid that I'm going to sweat through my shirt. And I, I don't think I don't think anybody necessarily wants to see that. So, so I'm probably going to keep it on. I mean, it, it almost feels like like playing in a game or something, right? Like the heat, the pressure's on just a little bit. So I, I don't mind that. I don't mind that. Uh, my hair may be soaking wet by the time I'm finished, but it, it's okay. Uh. So I'm Caleb Sears, um, and I am just extremely grateful for the opportunity to be able to stand before you. Uh, I think Pastor Rob just allowing me to to just study God's Word, to to bring forth something that I feel like God wants to say, and it's just always a pleasure, and it's just always just like honestly a joy of mine to be able to to speak truth that God gives, and uh, and so just I I think. I thank Pastor Rob for that opportunity. Uh, so on, on Saturday nights as a family, we, we usually watch movies together. We eat dinner in the living room, and we, we watch different movies from week to week, just things that our, our kids would like. And, and last night, my, my wife actually decided to pick the movie uh, Pinocchio, right? She picked it. She didn't, she didn't know that I was necessarily speaking on Jonah this morning. Uh, but it gave this, this illustration of, like, when I was a child, right? When I would think about Jonah and him being in a fish, like, that was kind of like the mindset that I had was this picture from the animated old-school Pinocchio where you had this, like, cavernous well, which doesn't really even make sense. Like, where are his organs? Like, where's anything from the inside of him? Instead, there's, like, there's like shipwreck and, like, all this different stuff that fills him, like, if a fish actually was like that, it would be floating to the top because of the lack of density that was actually in its place. And so you begin to like wonder, like, what was Jonah's actual three days in the belly of a fish look like? And it would have been actually supremely gross. Like, it would have been these close quarters, like, really tiny, tight fit inside the digestive system of a fish. And it wouldn't have been comfortable, it wouldn't have been open, and it wouldn't have been good. You would have hated it. And I, I think as we, we look at this life of Jonah and we, we really begin to study the character of who he is, he does not paint himself in the best light. He actually tells the details in this one story that we get about who he is, like the story that he is telling about himself. He does not put himself in a favorable light. Instead, he tells all the gross and the difficult details of his life. And so as we, we study this morning, we're going to be looking at a couple different passages, and we're going to be focusing mainly on just these different contrast, contrasting elements of his story. Um, but at the end of the day, he, he minimizes himself and magnimi- maximizes God in the process. And so as he belittles himself, he just shows how great God is. And so this morning, that's, that's really what I want us to focus on, is just how great of a father we have, and how much he loves and cares for us. And so I just want to start us off with a word of prayer, and then we'll we'll jump on into it. Father, I just thank you so much for mornings like these, um, where I've, I've gotten to study your word and just see more of who you are. And so, Father, I just pray that as we we look at these passages, and we look specifically at the life of Jonah, that we we just see more of your heart. But Father, also just like magnifying and open our eyes to the places where our hearts don't line up with your heart. And so Father, over the next few, few moments that we have together, I just, I just pray that you would bring us into alignment with you. Father, I trust you to provide. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Jonah. Jonah is not mentioned too much in the Bible. Like, he's got his own book, and he wrote it, and this was the story that he wanted to tell about himself. But we, we also see him a couple other times throughout Scripture, and one time in the Old Testament, and then in, and again in the New. Uh, in the Old Testament, he's mentioned in 2 Kings, and he, he, ruled, he was served under King Jeroboam II. 
uh, of the northern kingdom. And he prophesied, and we just see it in one verse in 2 Kings 14, 25, uh, that he was uh, going to, he prophesied that God was going to expand back the northern boundaries, the, the northern border of their kingdom. And God did that. And so Jonah is known as a good prophet because what he said is actually what came true. Uh, but probably more importantly, Jesus actually mentions Jonah. And he mentions him in a context in which that, uh, that those that are, that are doing difficult and doing negative things, that they will be judged like the Ninevites. Uh, because the Ninevites actually were the ones to, to repent. And so Jesus is, is somebody that points to the fact of Jonah's legitimacy as a prophet. Uh, but this morning, I, I want us to focus mainly on pretty much 99% of what we know about Jonah comes from the book of Jonah. And so I'm going to start us off with this first contrast that says that God, God called Jonah to go toward, but he, for some reason, he ran away. God called Jonah to run toward, but he ran away. I'm going to read Jonah verse one. I mean, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It said, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Am- Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because their wickedness has confronted me. However, Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down to go with them to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. And so as as Jonah was being called to go toward, I think we, we see this picture of of this unbelievable God. He's not just focusing on who his people are. He's not just focusing on uh, the people that are following him, but it was brought to his attention of great calamity. God saw the Ninevites and said that that is not right, and justice must be taking place in there. Like, I am not okay with that. And I think we see this picture throughout Scripture of of a God that cares about the poor, and he cares about the oppressed, and he cares about the weak. I was reading Psalms 9 this week, and and that's one thing that David points out very clearly. He said, man, I have not forgotten, and I am a refuge for those that are oppressed, those who are crushed. And I think that that is something that we can always cling to, and this fact that life is hard, and that when we see God and who he is, he does not forget us, especially in those moments that are most difficult and hardest in our lives. And Jonah, from the get-go, is pointing out how great of a God that he serves. But he doesn't entirely jump onto that. Instead, he actually doesn't like the fact that God takes notice of the poor and the oppressed in this moment. Because he himself, his own heart, has issue with the Ninevites. We later see in chapter 4 that... He wasn't afraid of going to Nineveh because of the Ninevites themselves. He was afraid because of God and how merciful and kind he is. And he didn't want anything to do with that. And so instead of running toward God's calling for his life, he ran away. And it was actually probably typical practice that that Jonah leaned into, these pagan understanding of God's that gods were, were connected to their regions, their power and their authority. So if you were a god in Egypt, then your power was localized in that. And so in this moment, Jonah decided to flee the presence of the Lord. And so whether it was the fact that he was trying to get away from God and his people, or he was just trying to think that disobedience in this moment would get him out of the presence, he became disobedient and ran away from the Father. I have four boys. Darion and Avery are my oldest. They are 12 and 10. And then I've got Calvin, who is five, and Banner, who is three. Uh, About a year and a half ago, uh, Calvin was sick, and for some reason he couldn't go with my mother uh, to watch. And so he had to end up coming to the office with me. And so Cal, obviously, in a workplace, I was working commercial property management, there wasn't a ton of stuff for him to do around there. But we had a uh, VR headset and a a virtual reality headset. You put on these, like, big glasses thing, and literally everything around you that you see is a virtual reality. And you can kind of move around in these environments. You can play all different kind of games. You can sit in a room with a big television screen, watch Netflix. And so I got him set up on that. You could could play different games. There's, like, games where you can play with, like, 
you put on a rocket pack and you can like fly around a city. You can, you can ride on a roller coaster and shoot at different targets. You can play golf if you wanted to, all in this, with these handheld sets. But back in that, that time, Cal was extremely into fishing. Like he loved watching fishing videos. He loved fishing at, at his grandparents' house in Florida. He, he loved fishing probably more than anything. And so in the, the VR headset, he was able to play a fishing game. Well, it was a little bit convoluted. Like, it was, it was a hard-to-play game. Like, it just wasn't intuitively great. And so you literally had to, like, cast with one hand, and then you would, like, reel in with another. And if your hand wasn't properly placed, it wouldn't reel the fish in. And it, it was just really frustrating. And so I got him set up on this game, and he was, he was playing it. And I, I went back to my desk and started working. And I could see him, but I, I just wasn't paying attention as I was paying attention to my work. The next thing I know is I hear like this really loud like pop on the floor. And then I hear Cal just start crying like crazy. Like he, he just is supremely upset. It turns out that he had kind of started wandering around in that virtual reality world. And he, it, it took place on like a beach. And he decided that he was actually going to jump into the water that was right there. And so he, he saw the beach and he literally jumped head first into the water, um, which did not work out too well because even though in virtual reality there was, a, there was a body of water in front of him, in real life it was, a, it was a hard cement floor. He ended up with a huge knot on his forehead, and uh, he, he ended up being okay, but he was, he was pretty sad in the moment. But I, I, I can't help but think that sometimes, like, we get caught up in missing what, what God has for us. And we get so focused on the way that we perceive and see things and think that it's reality. But when we run after those things, we get hit with hard truths in that moment. And it's usually not fun, and it's usually painful, right? And that's what happened to Jonah right here in this moment. He ran away from God and his calling on his life. And he went into a boat, and, and at that moment, he realized in that boat that he had messed up as the storm was going. But he was okay and at peace. He knew that God was going to do whatever God was going to do, and he knew how powerful God was. But he tried to outrun him, and he, he realized he couldn't, and he was going to have to die for it. Because the people in that boat realized, we've got to throw Jonah over if we're going to survive as he was running away. And so they threw him over. And at that moment, God sent something to save his life. Sometimes, I think we, we think that when we make mistakes, that it takes God's calling off of our life. Sometimes when we do the wrong thing, God calls us to something and we say no, that that removes God's calling in our life Amen. for what we're supposed to do. But our calling is not to is not dependent on our obedience. Our calling is dependent on God's faithfulness. Amen. It's dependent on his long suffering. And so Jonah's disobedience did not relieve him of his calling in that moment. It didn't keep him from necessarily being called to go to the Ninevites. Instead, God continued to use him running away as a larger story to bring him to a place where he could go to. And so I think so many times we think we make mistakes. We're not doing the right thing. God is, I, I, how in the world can God use me now? But it's actually in that moment where God can show up and be big and, and powerful. I'm not saying that we can't make mistakes or that, that we can't completely turn our back on God because I think there, there are evidence of, of God giving way to our stubbornness. But we don't need to lose sight of what God has called us to just because we've failed once or twice or because once, once God tells us that we're done, that's when we're done. But before that point, keep turning to him and submitting. And I think that brings me to my second point of this, this contrast that goes on. God sent Jonah to preach repentance, but he first had to repent. God chose a man to preach repentance that first had to repent. So here in chapter 2, verse number 9, We see Jonah had been swallowed by this fish. 
And he was sitting in there, and he realized what God had done and had shown immense grace and mercy to even keep him alive in this moment. And so he realized how powerful God is, and he just, he's prayer of thanksgiving from inside the fish. In verse 9 he says, But as for me, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will fulfill what I have vowed. Salvation is from the Lord. So at that moment, it, it took, sometimes, it, took, it takes things to bring repentance. Like it took this, this really difficult situation for him to get to a level in which that he was going to submit to the Lord. I think sometimes we think when God calls us to something that it's at that moment that we should be perfectly ready, equipped, our own understanding to do everything. But instead, I think it works a little bit more mysteriously. Sometimes he has to teach you things to get you to where he's calling you to be. Sometimes you have to submit to him to see those things. I'm reminded of, of my previous owner. I worked for Omega Tech Property. His name was, uh, the owner of that company was Bill Slappy. Uh, he, he owned a telecommunications company for a long time in, uh, in the Cahaba Heights area. And uh, he was somebody that, that got saved later in life. Like he was in his 20s. He had he'd grown up not a Christian. His, his father was actually an abortion doctor. And he, he grew up in a tumultuous home and, and background. But by the grace of God, he showed him who, God showed him who he was, and he fell in love with God. And, and in his early 20s, he felt like God was calling him to Africa. Like he called him to Africa to do radio ministry. And, and for some reason, those doors just never seemed to open for him. And so early in his life, he, he started that telecommunications company afterward because that was the door that God was opening for him. He, he continued on in his marriage, and, and he, he began to, to see God through that business, that telecommunications business. He would have Bible studies with his, with his whole crew. He would, he would create environments in which that people could see the Lord. And he created environments for the way that uh, he dealt with confrontation and quarrels was, was you, you were going to start in prayer. If we're arguing with one another, we're going to sit down and we're going to pray about this before we get there. And even to this day, like, as I worked for him, he still keeps God first and, and is super passionate about bringing the gospel to the business community. Every Monday, Monday at lunch, he has a, a network prayer group uh, with business leaders around the city of Birmingham. And every Friday morning, our, our buildings that we own, he has a Bible study that everybody's invited to. But to me, even as I worked for him, he, he encouraged me to, to be even more evangelistic in, in my, my sales. Like sales meetings were really actually lessons in evangelism, the way that he, he brought it. And, it. and it's interesting to see his life that he was originally called to go to Africa to do these things, but instead he submitted himself to the Lord. He gave his businesses to God, and God blessed him not only financially, but he blessed him with a heart after him. And he blessed him uh, with opportunities to see God, God work in his life and his business. And so then when, when God put it back on his heart to go to Africa about four years ago, at that point he had the knowledge and the resources to actually go and accomplish some of the things that God had called him to do. God had given him the, the, the financial ability where he, he went over to the first week that I was working there. He went to Cameroon. And he, he had a, uh, a business that he opened that was a micro-business loan business. And that's what was in the front of the house where community business leaders could come in and receive small business loans to make their businesses profitable. But in the back of the house, he actually hired about 18 different translators from neighboring countries to, to write a translation of the New Testament for, for people that uh, did not have a Bible in their heart language. And so these things couldn't have been done without God taking him, going through the business, him learning how to, to equip those things, how to understand finances and understand these things. God had given him a door into Africa, and he continues to go to this day. I mean, he went to Liberia probably a few, he went to Liberia a few months ago, and, and actually he got put on a radio 
uh, show there and was able to, to fulfill, honestly, what God had called him to do. And actually this week, he, he actually has been in Africa this week doing a lot of those similar things because God had put a calling on his life over 35 years ago. And he didn't fulfill that calling for another 35 years. Like, sometimes we think that God's calling on our lives sometimes are, are meant to be instantaneous. But I, I feel like as we look at the life of Jonah and who he is, he wasn't ready to go to the Ninevites when God called him. He had so many things that were going on in his heart, different things that he was dealing with and facing. He had to repent of before he could go to the Ninevites and speak to them. He had to get to a point where he was going to submit to God and his will and do it the way that he had called him to do it. And that, that didn't happen instantaneously. Instead, he had to run away. He had to be thrown off a boat. And, and eventually, he saw who God was and the merciful kindness that he had on him, realizing that he did need to go and speak for this great and powerful God. And that kind of leads me into this last contrast. Is that Jonah followed his heart, but forgot about the fathers. Jonah followed his heart, but forgot about the fathers. We're going to read Jonah 4, verse 10. But leading up into this, so Jonah actually does go to the Ninevites, and he begins preaching and saying that if you don't repent within 40 days, uh, you aren't going to make it, guys. God's wrath is going to come upon you. And, and at that moment, the Ninevites actually did. They repented. They, they, they tore their clothes. They became distraught for what they had done. And they, they'd heard the word of the Lord, and they repented of the things that they were doing. And so Jonah left, and he became angry because they actually repented. Um, but God set them up kind of to, to keep eyes on them over the next 40 days to, to make sure that they were doing what they were supposed to do. And as he was sitting there, waiting, uh, God made a plant grow right next to him. And this plant provided him shade. And he actually really enjoyed this plant. But then God sent a worm to eat that plant. And then he sent terrible heat to make that plant wither. And so then again, Jonah was angry that God gave him that plant and then also took it away. And so verse 10 is, is almost kind of God's response to that. So the Lord said, You cared about the plant, which you did not labor over and did not grow. It appeared in the night and perished in the night. Should I not care about a great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people, who cannot distinguish between their right and their left, as well as many animals? And so we're left with this picture of of Jonah, whose heart was just so set on that plant, but he couldn't see what God was seeing in that moment. Like, he was so set on, like, having that plant giving him shade, but he didn't care about 120,000 people that God had created, that God cared about, that God loved. Jonah was, Jonah was probably supremely angry at the Ninevites, not because they... They repented, but because he didn't even believe that they deserved a spot at repentance. He had seen the acts and the things that they had done, all the horrible, distraught, and harm that they had brought into the world. And he thought they deserved to be punished. Anybody in this world deserves punishment, deserves the wrath of God. It is them. They don't deserve access to repentance. But God's heart was different. God's heart was different. I, I think that sometimes we just see lies. And we get so caught up in our, our, our pride and who we are and where God has put us that we miss, we miss God's heart in the moment. Probably my favorite children's book, or not like a children's children's book, but is from the Chronicles of Narnia. It's uh, the silver chair. And just the, the allegories that are weaved throughout that story is just something that, as an adult, has just impressed on me over and over again. Um, 
essentially the gist of the story is that uh, two kids are sent to this magical world where there are kings and queens, they're talking to animals, all different kinds of things. And they are sent to find this lost prince. And they're given very specific instructions of how to get there. And they constantly choose to... They, they constantly get distracted by the things that are going on, and they don't actually do the things that they were supposed to do. But they eventually get to the place where the prince is located, and it's actually under the ground, well underneath where, where they started out from. And there's a queen under there who's supremely evil, and she just rules over those people with an iron fist and treats people poorly and just um, hoards resources and treats people terribly and all these kind of things. And so they get down there, and they begin to confront this queen for who she is. And the queen at that moment, she doesn't attack. Like, that's not her game plan. She, she's in this room, and she, she starts a fire and makes the room really warm for them. She throws this powder into the fire, and it, it makes this very sweet aroma happen in the air. And so the warmth and that sweet aroma just kind of subdues the people that were going against them. And then she pulls out an instrument, a mandolin, and she starts playing it and just kind of like this, this low doldrum of like easing them into their comforts. And then she begins to telling them lies. She, she tells them, there is no world above mine. They are way underneath the ground. There's, there's nothing there. There's no kingdom up there. How could you say such a foolish thing? And like she begins to belittle them and tell them lies of like, no, I'm the only queen that exists. I'm the only one that can do all these different things. And they begin to buy into these lies because they've, they've gotten too comfortable. Well, a, a creature that, it's, that has kind of carried them along the way to where they're supposed to be, he doesn't get distracted by those comforts. And instead, he stomps out the fire with his foot, burns himself, but in the same time, wakes everybody up from the lies that were being spoken to them. And they kind of arise and defeat the queen in that moment. And I, I think that sometimes life is very much like that. Truth is so hard to come by. Like, truth is, is so valuable to me. If I, could, if I could have access to truth on a regular basis, it's worth its weight in gold. Because so many lies are being portrayed in our world. So many things are being told about who I'm supposed to be, or who I am, or the way that I am. So many lies are being told about the world and what's going on out there. So many lies are being told that divide us as people, that make us not love our neighbors properly. So many lies are being told out there about how we're supposed to live and these different things. And they aren't true. Instead, a lot of these lies just sink us further and further into our comforts. They make us feel good about ourselves. But they make us not focus on the kingdom. They give us temporary relief from the pressures of the world. But it doesn't give us a peace that surpasses understanding. Like these lies, they, they are like candy that dissolve in our mouth. And we just eat them up. And that's what happened to Jonah. He missed it. He missed God's heart for people. He missed God's heart for the oppressed in the town of Nineveh. He missed God's heart for justice. He missed God's heart for mercy. He missed God's heart for grace. Where am I missing it? What lies have I bought into? What kind of things am I believing that are not in line with the word of the Father? Like, what am I missing here? Because I would hate, I would hate for it. God, to call me to somewhere, and I miss it because I'm so centered on myself and my pride and my arrogance or the things that I think I'm supposed to be doing or the things that, that, that I feel like are too painful that I can't continue on in.
Because that's, that's the thing about Jonah here, right? If, if I was going to tell a story that was going to be told for the rest of my life, I don't think it would be this one. Like, if people were going to know me for generations to come, like, I don't think that would be the story that I would tell others of. And so I think this is evidence, even the fact that we are telling this story to this day, that Jonah eventually humbled himself. He began to align himself and submitted himself to the Father. Because nobody knows these words. Nobody knows this story outside of Jonah. He was by himself in the belly of that fish. The, the words, those prayers, were, those were his. And so he submitted himself, and what he did was he minimized himself. He actually made himself look very foolish in his life. But in his foolishness that he magnified, he also magnified God's grace and his mercy. And so, Father, as we, as we begin to focus on you, as we begin to see who you are, let us shrink in comparison to your greatness. Let me pray for us. Father, I don't, let us not lose sight of how big you are. You not only control the wind and the seas, you not only control animals, but, but Father, you control it all. The stars in the sky. But who am I, Father, that I could think that I could be prideful or arrogant in your presence? Who am I to think that I could run away from you? And so, Father, I pray that you use these moments to just draw us in. Because what you want is for us to submit. So over the next few moments, just submit.